everybody. It's great to see you this morning. If you're new with us today, my name's Chuck. I'm one of the pastors here. I want to welcome you to Crossbridge. Uh, Crossbridge Church exists to make growing followers of Jesus Christ that know God, that seek to grow intentionally, and live to make a difference where we live, work, and play. And we'd love to help you take your next step uh, in knowing Jesus and following Jesus. But to do that, if you're new, we need you to introduce yourself. That's the first step. So you can introduce yourself by stopping at the first time guest tent you probably saw on your way in. You can stop there. We'd love, we have a gift for you. Or you can fill out our Connect card. Uh, there's physical ones uh, in seat pockets or under the chairs, depending on where you're sitting. Or you can use the QR code on the screen and, and fill one out there. And we'd just love to begin the process of helping you getting connected here, especially during the summer. We have a lot of summer events, a lot of things going on in the life of our church. And I want to continue to put before you the event of the summer, Serve Day, which will be here just before you know it, uh, Saturday, July 13th. It's a, it's a Serve Day for our entire church right here in the building as we seek to package 12,000 meals uh, for the needy. And so we're partnering with an organization. We did this last year. We did 10,000. This year we're seeking to do 12,000. We think we can do it. And so we'd love for you to sign up for it. We need a certain number of people, so please tell us, you know, if you know you're here that Saturday, you're not out of town, come bring the family. There's, uh, uh, for kids at certain ages, uh, I think it's on there, I think it's uh, kindergarten up, but really, uh, they can be included, and it's just really, it's a very fun atmosphere as we all get to serve together. There's moments where every thousand, I think we ring like this bell to say, hey, we hit this marker, and that's really exciting because we just see ourselves getting closer and closer to the mark. So it's, it was my favorite thing we did as a church last summer, and so I just want to encourage you to sign up and be there for it. It'd be great. And then there's a lot of other events going on uh, for all different ages and stuff. So go to our events page. That's what that QR code is. That's what the QR code is on the back of the chairs. Goes to the events page and tells you what's happening this summer here at Crossbridge. Still a lot more stuff happening uh, in the last few next coming weeks. Um, we just had our kids return from kids camp, which I heard was just amazing. And tomorrow, our 7th through 12th graders leave for student camp. And so very excited about that. Uh, there's a couple of you slightly excited uh, <laughs> about that. Um, but we have some great volunteers going and you know it's amazing all these trips that go on it's it's people just like you who are taking time off work taking time away from families to spend time with our kids to pour into them and so it's not just the events of the camp it's those relationships and just things happen at camp when you get kids out of their normal environment and you get them to a place where like you know loving intentional adults can point them to Jesus they're in environments that are pointing them to Jesus I'm, I became a Christian at a summer camp my life was in incredibly impacted at a youth camp. And, uh, um, and I just so encouraged and so excited about the, these camps we have going. So be praying for these camps. I think if you get our email update, if you don't, you should sign up for that using our Connect card. Uh, we've been putting out the last couple weeks, hey, pray for these camps. Uh, so this week, pray for our student camp as you think of that. They leave tomorrow morning. Well, um, this morning we're continuing, uh, just, we're, it's not really a message series, it's really just kind of some thoughts of these few weeks of summer at Crossbridge, so we're continuing that vein, uh, although we're going to be in a passage of scripture that's very close to a passage we studied a couple of weeks ago, and that's just kind of how it lined up. So if you would uh, stand with me for the reading of God's word, we're going to be reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. And remember, we stand because the scripture tells us that the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. These are eternal words, living words, active words. So as you hear these words, don't just hear someone reading to you say, begin to say, God, speak to my heart through your word. And the angel of the church and Laodicea, and to the angel of the church and Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot or nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so you may be rich and white garments so you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those who I love, I reprove and discipline so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers... 
I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray together. Father, we have read your scripture now by your Holy Spirit. Would you now draw us into it? Speak to us. Take your written word and make it a living word in our hearts now. We ask that you would help us to not be distracted or to be a distraction. We ask that you would just strengthen our faith today to trust you, to believe, to surrender, to walk with you. Holy Spirit, do what Jesus sent you to do now, to remind us of all truth, to convict to convince, to challenge, to comfort, to counsel. Do that all now. We pray this in and through and because of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Now, when I was a young man in uh, college years, um, I was working at this bookstore, and so uh, I had a break, and so I went across the street to the convenience store to get a snack. And, you know, convenience store snacks, you know, they're on road trips, it's all fun, but, you know, you shouldn't live on those things. It's not good for you. But, you know, I was young. I was late teens, early 20s, and, um, you know, and, and so I was like, okay. So I got one of those little package of, like, chocolate donuts, you know, and they're just, like, delicious, but they'll kill you. Uh, but, you know, you're young, you feel invincible, so you, you get those now. And you get it. And so then I went over, and I was like, ooh, I want to get some milk with that. So I walked over to the little milk things and there was chocolate milk. And I was like, you know, I should have standards, not have too much chocolate. And then they had whole milk. And I really am not a whole milk person. At that time, I was a 2% person. And they didn't have that. And then they had this other thing, uh, half and half. And I was like, well, that's not so bad. That's half fat and half milk. So that's okay. It's like 50%, you know? And so I got that. And then I went back over to back to the bookstore, back to the break room, opened it up, had a just incredible, tasty little chocolate cake donut opened up my milk, took one swig, and just spit it out into the garbage. It's like, oh, and I say out loud to the people in the back room, it's like, they gave me sour milk. I should go get my money back. And, you know, one of the ladies that worked there, she goes, that's not sour milk. That's half and half. Yeah, half fat, half real milk. She's like, oh, no, honey. You know, and so I learned that day what half and half was. So uh, it was a big, big day for, for my life. So I'm wondering, you know, you ever, you ever drank something and just immediately you're just like, oh, get this out of me. Maybe you had some bad milk. Maybe something just, you just, you just made you spit out. Or you know that moment when your, your stomach hurts and you realize this is only going to end one way. <laughs> you know, it's not just, oh, I'm not feeling so good. It's like, you know, it's, it's like, oh, this is, this is, this is going to be bad. And so it's going to be real bad. And so it's just this moment of just like, I, this stuff's got to get out of me. And that's kind of gross to start talking about in the sermon. But, you know, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today is what Jesus, what he finds distasteful and upsetting about the church. I mean, have you ever experienced something that was distasteful at a church? been a part of a church for any amount of time. I mean, it can be any church. It could even be this church. Because sure you have. There's broken people in churches. Churches aren't perfect. And sometimes there's just things you find in them, whether it's the organizational part or just the people part that's distasteful. You Maybe you found the hypocrisy, the lack of compassion, the commercialism. You found, you found that distasteful. Well, what does Jesus find distasteful about a church? And again, I'm not talking about necessarily about the organization part of it, which is needed, but the life of the community, the people in it. And when we find something distasteful about the church, usually we, we take the seat of a critic. We take the seat of, it's really easy to point and go, bad church, bad pastor, bad people, and just kind of just be that critic that watches the game but never plays. But today, in this passage from Revelation, Jesus speaks to us and no one gets to be a critic. You just get to be a listener. And no one in this church that Jesus speaks to can say, oh yeah, Jesus, you're... No, he's like, I'm talking to all of you. Search your heart. Search your heart and deal with my words. Hear what the Spirit is saying. 
Because there's something about this church, this church in this place called Laodicea, that he finds so distasteful. He said, I, I, I just want to spit you out. And really the word spit there is actually the idea of vomit, that you make me sick, which sounds pretty strong and pretty harsh, and it is. But Jesus is always full of grace and truth, John's gospel tells us. So Jesus, as he says really hard words to this church, and may even be saying hard words to us today, there is so much grace in what he's saying. So we're just going to walk through this passage and then make some comments at the end. Let's start back in verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write. Now, if you remember a couple weeks ago, we actually talked about the first church that Jesus wrote to in the book of Revelation, the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, uh, and the first like uh, you know seven verses. And so this church in Laodicea is the last church he writes to. And when he says angel, that word angel there means messenger. And so is it like really an angelic being that he is sending to a church or is it a messenger, like human messenger? Well, we don't know. And the English translators chose the word angel. And so we can't really, you know, we have to, we have to leave that up to, we'll find out one day. But it says then, write the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Now, this is how Jesus is describing himself, which in our language seems a little weird because you, amen, you know, that's how we end prayers. But in the Hebrew, the, the idea of the amen is something is of value. It's, it's valid. It's binding. It's, it's a trustworthy statement. It's a foundation you can be built upon. Jesus is saying, I'm the one that is trustworthy, a trustworthy foundation for all of life. I am the amen. When he says he's the faithful and true witness is the idea that I am the true revelation of the Father. That you want to know who God is like, you want to know how to get to God, you come to and through Jesus. He's the genuine article. And then when it says the beginning of God's creation, it's an interesting phrase because that word beginning there is the Greek word ark, where we get our word archetype. So it's not like the idea that, you know, I, well, I thought, you know, Adam was the first human being created. He's not saying he's the first human being created, that he is the archetype of God's creation. He is the source. He is the originator. He's like, what should God's creation look like perfectly? The life and the person of Jesus. So he's the trustworthy foundation. He is the true representative of the heart of God. And he is the archetype for all humanity. And then he says, now listen to me. And he says, I know your works. Verse 15, you're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, a lot of times uh, you, you may have heard uh, someone teach this before and say, you know, God would rather you be cold toward him and just not like him or be hot toward him and just be a passion about him. And, you know, I, I don't know if that's actually what Jesus means here, because remember, he's writing to an actual church and actual people of Laodicea. And a big thing about Laodicea was the water. And near it was all these different kind of water sources and different things. There was these cold, cool, refreshing springs that were near them. And there was also this kind of hot, healing waters. And there was these mineral waters, all these kind of things. And both had good, you know, were used for good purposes. And Jesus is like, I, I wish you were used to refresh people. I wish you were be healing people. But, but you're neither. You're in this middle, you're in this area of lukewarmness. And this is basically Jesus saying, you're not passionate about me. You're, you're the, the amen and the ark is not worth being passionate about. That you're, you have this lukewarm, just this indifference. Now, lukewarmness happens because of compromise. We start to compromise. We start compromising morally. We start compromising theologically and think, well, I know the scripture says this, but I'm going to make it say what I want to say. You see, you start seeing leadership compromise so that people won't leave their church. And compromise then begins in this kind of tepid faith, which is just, it, it's not refreshing to people. It's not healing to people. It's not honoring to Jesus. It's just kind of bleh. 
And there was a source of water near Laodicea that if you drank it, it could make you sick. And Jesus is like, you're kind of like that source. You're, 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 you become like that where you're not refreshing and you're not something good to take when you're up sick. You're, you're, you, are some, you are something that just, just kind of makes me want to vomit, which is really hard to hear. But we have to keep listening to hear everything he wants to say. He says, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Now, Laodicea was famous for three things. Their wealth, their clothing, and their medicine. Laodicea was a big banking city. It was a big uh, clothing city. A lot of clothing was made. Fashion was made uh, for the world there. And it was known for its medicine. Because of some of those uh, water and the stuff like that there, the, they, had, they were very famous for the salve that people could put on their eyes. And, and, and really, it, they were very famous for different things like that. And he's like, you think you've got it all together, but really, you're pitiful, you're poor, you're blind and naked. And of course, he means spiritually, like in the areas that matter. He goes, yeah, you may have it all together. You may have great bank account. You may have the finest clothes and great modern medicine, but you don't have what you really need. You don't see your true condition. And their wealth their ease, their comfort had pushed out passion for Jesus. And I think that sometimes we could be in the same kind of place where because of where we live, and you might say, well, I'm not wealthy, but compared to most of the world, we are. We, we have more choices than most of the world. But our wealth, our comfort, our ease, that does not breed passion for Jesus. That does not breed passion for his name and passion for his mission. Comfort dulls us. Comfort makes us complacent. Comfort makes us begin to go, eh, I don't know, you know. It, it just, it kind of, it can make us feel self-sufficient and blind us to our need for Jesus. I think one of the hardest places to be a disciple of Jesus is in affluent middle to middle to upper class areas. Because there you just, you're just not in touch daily with the desperate need you have to be close to God. But Jesus sees through all that. He sees through all our stuff. He sees through all our comfort. He sees through all the things that we have, all the outside stuff that makes us look great. He sees through our homes. He sees through our cars. He sees through our beautiful neighborhoods and manicured lawns. He sees through our social media. He sees through all that and says, you don't realize what you really are. That without me, you're, you're wretched. You're, you're pitiful. You're poor. You're, you're blind. You, you can't see life how it really is. And, and you're naked before I see you as you really are. And God's saying, nothing covers your life before me. Your success doesn't. Your morality doesn't. Your, religious, your religion doesn't. God sees us as we really are. Now, if you just stop there, it's like, man, what happened to the nice Jesus in the Gospels? The guy raised us from the dead, and now he's, he's kind of ticked off. But now Jesus takes a turn in what he says. And look what he says next. He says, now I, I counsel you, which means I, I'm coming alongside you, and I'm going to care for you now, and I'm going to help you. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so you may be rich, and white garments, so you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Now, of course, he's, all, he's using metaphors here to talk about, he's, I, I, come to me for true wealth. Come to me for the true riches. Come to me and let me clothe you with my righteousness. Let me cover your sin. Let me cover your shame. Let me cover your guilt with my life, my death, my resurrection. Let me pay for that. Let me, let me cover over that and be, and let me open your eyes to how reality is. That's one of the ongoing prayers of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter one, he, he's praying that the eye, we should be praying that the eyes of our heart may continually be enlightened, may continually be opened to see all that God has done for us in Jesus, to see God as he really is, to see as God sees so we can live as God calls us to live. 
He's like, come to me. Now, it's interesting that he says, buy from me. Buy from me. Because he just called them poor. Now, earlier in the last series we did, when we walked through the Beatitudes, the very first week we talked about Jesus' Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I actually referenced this passage in that message. And if you don't remember it, I'm heartbroken. Um, But it's that interesting thing of Jesus, you know, one of the things about moving forward spiritually is realizing how desperately in need of God's ongoing supply of grace and help and kindness to us that we are, that we are dependent on him. We need him. We need to be trusting him and following him. We realize our poverty of spirit. So he just called them poor, but he counsels them to buy. How do you buy gold when you're poor? It might not make sense. But what they would do in that day is if they wanted to buy something and they didn't have the money for it, they sold themselves. They became a servant to that person. I want to buy this land. What money do you have? I don't have any money, but I want this land to work so my family has a place to live and we can grow our own crops and all that. So how will you pay for this? I will work for you for an agreed amount of of time. And and it's not just a job. It was considered a binding slavery. Not the slavery when we kind of hear those things, but it was a surrendering of your rights, a surrendering of yourself. So when Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me, he's like, give me you. Surrender to me. Drop all the pretenses. Drop all the games. Drop all the trying to cover yourself up and make yourself look good and act like you have it all together. That's just exhausting. You don't have it together. And I counsel you to to stop trying. I counsel you to surrender to me, to come to me and let me cover your shame. Let, Let me cover your guilt. Let me open your eyes and let me give you true riches. You might say, well, what are those true riches? Well, he's gonna get there in just a moment. But see, Jesus in these words right here shows us He's not mad at the church at Laodicea. It's incredible, especially in our day of age, because when we ha- want to criticize someone, we usually just write them off and they're a villain. We want mercy, but we want everyone else to get theirs. We understand the nuance of our story and why we need kindness, but other people, they're the worst. Jesus comes and he says really strong things. You make me sick. But at the same time, he's like, but I counsel you. I'm coming right up next to you, and I'm going to give you a way out of this. He's able to say really hard words and the most gracious invitation ever, which leads to the next line where he says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. He's saying, I love you. I'm not mad at you. I'm not like, I'm not writing you off. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm done with you people. I'm just saying, listen, I, I love you. That's why I'm saying these things to you. And so when I love someone, I, I tell them the truth. And I, and I have that thing happen in their life to help wake them up to, to turn to me. So listen, since I love you and I'm counseling you out of this, you should be zealous and repent. And both those term words are written in the Greek in the present tense, like ongoing zealous, ongoing passion. Keep on having passion. And the idea of repent there in the tense in the Greek is and do it now. Don't wait till things slow down at work. Don't wait till the kids are back in school. Don't wait till you're older. Don't wait till you graduate. Don't wait till you're married. Don't wait till the baby's born. Don't wait till the kids are out of the house. It's like, don't wait. I counsel you come to me and surrender to me. And and listen, I love you. And I'm just going to, I'm going to keep telling you the truth. And I'm going to keep trying to make life happen in such a way where you're going to hopefully wake up and go, I need Jesus. So have, be zealous about this. Be intentional about this. You have some, have some drive in you about this and turn to me now. That's what repent means. Turn to me now. You're not groveling. We're not going, oh God, I'm the worst. Have mercy on me. No, I'm I'm saying, God, you're right. Jesus, you're right. 
I, 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 I let my comfort, I let my stuff, I let, I let the, the culture I live in infect my heart more than I infect it. And I'm coming to you now and I'm just freshly surrendering to you. And, I, and I'm not going to try to just make myself look good. Jesus, I want your grace and righteousness to make me good, to cleanse me, to change me. I need you to open my eyes to see the world as you see it, to see things the way you see it, to see the people around me the way you see them. I need you, and I'm going to do it now. So Jesus is he's just, he's saying, be zealous, stay passionate. And do it now. And then he tells us the true offer, what the riches are. What does it mean to buy from him gold? What does it really mean to say, I surrender to you? It's probably some of the most famous words of Jesus spoken. You probably heard it before. But hopefully today the Holy Spirit will help us hear it in fresh, a fresh light. Behold. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now, a lot of times this passage is used by when people are trying to help people uh, meet Jesus for the first time, surrender to Jesus for the first time. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not like it's twisting the meaning, but the context of the passage is Jesus is not talking to people that aren't Christians. He's talking to the church. He's talking to the community of faith. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to the church in Laodicea, and he's talking to you, and he's talking to me, and he's like, hey, I'm standing outside your life, and I'm knocking. I want to come in. See, lukewarmness pushes Jesus to the outside. He, he's not sinner anymore. He's not essential anymore. He's not your passion anymore. You keep pushing him to the periphery and eventually he's on the outside. He's on the outside of your sexuality. He's on the outside of your work life. He's on the outside of, the, of your marriage. He's on, the out, he's on the outside of your mind and your heart. He's on the outside of how you're dealing with suffering. You just keep pushing him out. No, I'll handle this. I, I'm going to deal with this. I, I can handle And you just keep pushing him away through your choices, through your attitudes. We do this. I do this. You do this. That's lukewarmness where we're just, we're, we're, sometimes we're even unaware how we're just pushing Jesus out and we're closing the door on him. We're excluding him from areas of our life. But look how kind and gracious he is. He's like, I'm at the door. I'm knocking. He didn't just say, well, I'll just take my toys and leave. No, I'm still here. I didn't go anywhere. You went somewhere. I'm standing here and I'm knocking. I mean, how do we fight off lukewarmness? Because lukewarmness is what the culture is trying to, it's the current of our culture. It's the, it's the scheme of the evil one for you and me. It's, it's just what our own sinful flesh will just lead us toward naturally if we're not intentional. How do we fight that off? We just keep opening the door of our life to Jesus. We just keep saying, Jesus, I want you here. Jesus, I want you in this area of my life. Jesus, I want you in charge. Jesus, I, sir, I just keep, I'm just going to keep opening the door of my heart and my life to him. He's Because he's not just knocking. Notice he says he's knocking. He says, I stand at the door and knock, but if anyone hears, he doesn't say my knock. He says my voice. I'm knocking and I'm calling your name. I'm saying, why don't you come open the door? I was having breakfast with a guy I meet with for accountability and encouragement this week. And we were talking about uh, something that's been going on in my life for a while. And I was like, I feel like I'm in this one area. I'm at this like fork in the road. And I said, I kind of know what to do things here. I, got, I know the steps, I know the plan, I know the action. Like, I need this, this, and this, this, and all. And, and you know, then we'll, then we'll be on our way and stuff will happen. But there's this other path, the unknown path. The unknown path of what if I included Jesus more and didn't just try to take charge. This other path of what if I submitted my way to him and inquired of him and, and really sought him. And I, and I, I told him, I said, I... I that way seems uncertain to me. 
that way seems kind of cloudy. He's like, well, what do you think you should do? I said, well, here's the thing. I think that there's, I'm, that way is calling me. And so that's how Jesus is. He's calling to you and he's saying, follow me. But I can't see it working out if I follow you. If I stick to my plans and what I do, and what I want, and my way of life, it'll work out. You think. What if you follow me? What if you start putting into practice my words? What if you come open the door and let me in? What if you come open the door and let me call the shots in this area? What if, what if, you, what if you just said, Jesus, I want you here. I want your full rule, your full reign, your full person, your full presence in my heart. And remember, he's not just saying this to Christians. He's saying this to the church. What if a church, what if the church said, Jesus, we want you here? You're like, well, isn't he everywhere? I mean, this, this isn't like Jesus, like losing salvation. This is, remember, this is like a metaphor. There's no like door in your heart. They've never done surgery and go, look at this. We found a miniature door. That's interesting. You know, that, remember, this, these are metaphors he's using to understand about the, the access, the permission, the, the dropping of our defenses. And he's like, let me in. Let me in. Open the door and let me in. Because look what he says when he says, if you open the door, I will come into him. And he has a very fascinating phrase, and eat with him and he with me. Now, that's really strange. He said, you make me sick, but I'm going to come in and eat your food. Like, what, you know, again, it's a very metaphorical passage. To eat with him and he with me is a Middle Eastern way of saying, I will make a covenant with you to be for you all that I am and to share with you all that I have. See, when you open your life to Jesus, Jesus is saying, I'm going to be all that I am to you and I'm going to share with you all that I have. One guy, Brennan Manning, he says that even today, an Orthodox Jew will meet you for coffee and may grab a quick bite for lunch with you. But when they extend an invitation to dinner, what they're saying is, come to my Mikdash Miat, my miniature sanctuary, my dining room table, and we will celebrate the most beautiful experience that life affords, friendship. See what Jesus is saying here, You've pushed me to the outside. I'm at the door knocking. I'm calling to you. And if you'll open your life to me, what I'm really bringing you is my friendship. The friendship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's still the Savior. He's not your buddy. He's not your butler. He's not your life coach. He's still surrender to him. He's still on the throne. He's still the one calling the shots. But in the midst of that, he says, but I'm not just that. I'll come be your friend. I'll sit with you. And we will sit at the most intimate place. For a Hebrew to hear this, to, that, that when you have dinner with him, this, it, was this, it was this invitation to let's be friends. That the dining room table was called the Mikdash Miat, the miniature sanctuary. It was such an important experience to break bread together. And Jesus is saying, that's what I want. Let me in and I'll bring my friendship to you. I, I, we will be friends. I will share with you all I am and everything I got. How incredibly gracious. I hope you see the grace. I hope you see his kindness. I hope you see how amazing he is. Grace and truth right here in this passage. Your lukewarmness makes me sick. But I'm coming alongside you. I want to give you counsel. Come to me. Surrender to me. Uh, I'll give you true riches. I, I'll, I'll clothe you and I'll give you a sense of identity that, 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 that whatever you're trying to find your identity in cannot give you. I'll open your eyes to reality and you'll see things from my point of view. And listen, I'm at the door and I want to come in. I want to come in and I want us to be friends. I want us to be close. I want to share with you all I am and all I have. Will you hear me? and open the door. It's what he says to you. It's what he says to me. It's what he says to a church. 
A church can close him out. A church can push him out and have the right beliefs, the right thoughts. They have their nice programs. They like everything about their church. I've got my friends. I like the size. It's nice. It's cozy. It's big. It's broad. It's traditional. It's, it's contemporary. Oh, I like our steeples. I like our storefront. You can have all the stuff you like, but Jesus may be on the outside. And so the big two application points for to this whole thing is, it's on my heart for us today, is for you, is Jesus on the outside? Is he on the outside knocking, calling your name and saying, let me in? And is he on the outside of the church? Is he on the outside of Crossbridge in any area saying, let me in? Let me in. Let me into your community groups. Let me in. Drop your defenses. Take me at my word. Surrender to me. Let me in. And then he ends with this amazing statement. He says, the one who conquers. What a fascinating thing. That surrendering to him and opening the door to him, Jesus calls that conquering. He calls humility strength. He calls repentance winning. He calls surrender and opening the door and saying, come in. I give myself to you. He calls that conquering. You're not giving in to sin. You're not giving up and walking away. He said, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. I mean, that, you're not just a sub, we're not just subjects in his kingdom. There's this very interesting thing that the scripture in the New Testament calls us co-heirs with Christ. Revelation paints this picture of we're co-ruling with Christ. He's still the king of kings, but we have this role with him. And it's not really explained very well, but it seems pretty amazing that we get everything he deserves. We receive the blessing and honor from him. So why go through this passage? I mean, really, again, to ask are you living with Jesus on the outside of any area of your life? And really to ask a question I'm asking, and I'd love for you to start asking, what kind of church do we really want to be? Do we just want to be one that's just good enough? We have, we have some choices. We can just stay like we are and just be nice and, you know, have good teaching and, you know, just kind of go through stuff and have a good time together. We could try to become like, you know, one of those like six flags under Jesus machine churches where people repel in. And I mean, we, we could do some stuff, you know, I could repel in every Sunday. I could like lower myself and dress like Han Solo and do a Star Wars series. You know, that'd be kind of fun, you know? And, you know, people do that and they have, they love Jesus and great. I don't know their hearts. I'm just saying we could, we, could, we could do ridiculous things that for us would be ridiculous. And maybe they're not sinful, they're just silly. We could just, we could just do church and keep Jesus on the outside. Or collectively, personally, individually, group by group, person by person, ministry by ministry, we could just develop this attitude, this consistent persistent way of life that doesn't give up and doesn't give in, that keeps just every day and every way opening the door and saying, come in. We want you here. Have full rule and reign here. The moves of God that are done in history and revivals usually start with a small group of people who start saying, Jesus, we want you. We want you to move here. My favorite story of a revival is an island in Europe, the Hebrides. And it starts with these two older ladies that start praying. They're so, they're so old and so really the word decrepit really meets them. They can't even go to church. So they just start praying at their homes. And then other prayer meetings start and they start having this. And one of their big things is, is that younger people aren't coming to the church anymore. And they mean by younger people, they mean teenagers, they mean young adults, and they just are burdened for that. 
and they just begin to call on the name of the Lord and they just begin to claim as his promises. And they said, you said, if we were thirsty, you would bring water to thirsty ground. Will you be true to your word? It's calling on Jesus and saying, Jesus, you said if we open the door, you would come in and be all that you are to us and you would be our friend and you would be an abiding presence here. We're gonna take you at your word. Could we become a people like that? Could we live a life like that? Because I think Jesus is saying to some of us about our entire life, let me in. I think he's probably saying to most of us about certain areas of our life, let me in. And I think he could be saying to our church, don't shut me out. Let me in. Let me into your heart. Let me in. Be the consume. Let me be your center, your consuming desire. Let me be the functional center of all that you are in your life and in your church. Let me in. Holman Hunt was one of the greatest British painters of the Victorian era, and one of his most famous paintings is called "The Light of the World." I have a picture. It might be hard for you to see, but uh, if you make it bigger, it's fuzzy. You may have seen this before. This is a picture of Jesus. And, you know, he has a crown on here and he's holding a lantern. Uh, the, the painting is actually called The Light of the World, but it's actually a rendition of an, an artistic, of course, picturing of Jesus standing at the door. Now, the lamp, of course, is, is kind of a picture of his word. You know, the psalmist says that thy word is, is a lamp unto your feet. So he's wanting to come in and bring his truth and bring his word. And he's knocking at the door. And he's, he's the victorious Jesus. He's got a crown and he's robed in, you know, in his victory. And he's knocking at the door. Notice in front of the door, some weeds have grown up. That door hasn't been open for a while. And, and Holman Hunt here is picturing that he still stands knocking and calling. And I don't know if you can tell from where you're sitting, but you can look this up on your own time later. The door does not have a knob on the outside. Because Hunt's idea is it can only be opened from the inside. You have to open the door. Jesus says, if you open the door, I'm not kicking down the door. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, and so just that picture there, is there an area of your life that he doesn't have access to? I mean, maybe you've never turned the door handle, but you know that you need him and you just need to say, Jesus, for the first time ever, don't leave the picture, go back to it. Um, I open my life to you and you become a Christian. You surrender your life to him the first time. Maybe you opened the door a while ago, but you've been slowly excluding him. Because you don't want him interfering with your vacations, your time off, your pay raises, your new toys are really exciting. But if you're honest, when you really just kind of get down, you're you kind of bored, empty, dry. And in some ways you miss him. But he's knocking. He's calling you. Open the door. Let him in. The weeds won't get in his way. Maybe there's rooms of your heart, closets of shame and guilt and fear. that You've kind of just shoved stuff in and you're just like, yeah, let's just not deal with that. And Jesus was walking up to those doors and he's knocking and saying, well, why don't you let me in there? Maybe how you put your life together, you know, your, your, your internal kitchen and how you organize your life. And he's excluded and he's like, let me in. I mean, let him in the office. Let him in your family room. Let him in the room you call money. Let him in the room you call success. Let him in the room you call significance and security. And I would just say, well, how do we do that? I would just begin to pray. And I would just say, Jesus, I open the door. I want you everywhere. Most mornings during the week, Kathleen and I usually have a time where we're praying together in the morning. It didn't happen every day, but, but a lot of, most mornings it does. And one of the regular prayers we pray is, Jesus, you're welcome here. 
You're welcome in our home. You're welcome in our marriage. We want you here. We're throwing open the doors and we're saying, come in. I would just begin to pray that. I begin to pray. I begin to pray that over your marriage. I begin to, you know, go in your kids' rooms and say, Jesus, I want you here. I want you in my kids' life. Would you help them hear your voice and open their life to you? Because they still have to be drawn. You know, the, the words are true that no one comes to the Father unless they're drawn. They, the work of the Spirit draws. And just continue to say, Jesus, we want you here. You're paying your bills. You're doing it online. Jesus, I want you here. You sit down at your desk. Jesus, I want you here. And what you're just saying is, I open the door. I'm going to fend off. I'm just going to open. I'm not going to have an area of my life where I close the door on you. When you're in traffic, Jesus, I want you here. I'm not going to close the door on you when I'm behind the wheel of a car. Jesus, I want you here. And what if we begin as a church? That we, we, when we gather for worship, when we gather in groups, when we're, that we just have this posture together, Jesus, we want you here. Second Chronicles chapter 7 says, For the eyes of the Lord look to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose hearts are completely his. He's looking for people whose hearts are his, so he might show himself strong. He's looking for hungry people. This isn't about salvation and grace. This isn't about God pursuing sinners. This is about his people. Do my people want me? Are my people hungry for me? Will my people let me in? And let me be not just the forgiver, the get out of hell free card distributor. Will my people let me be God? Will they let me be me? And what if we just said, Jesus, if you're looking for people, the hearts are devoted. We feel like we got a long way to go. The best we know how, here we are. We want you here. We want your tangible presence. We want more God consciousness about our life. We want you influencing and leading and moving here. We're not going to close you out of anywhere in our life. So when Holman Hunt was elderly, he got upset because the original painting, can you go back to the original painting? This original painting, he, he painted and gave to a college. Well, it became so famous, and so many people wanted to see it because it was so popular, the college began to charge for it. I mean, that's, you know, of course, we can make money off Jesus. And um, so Holman was very upset about this as an elderly person, so he decides to make a new painting of it and to give it to a church. And of course, tells the church you can't charge for it. So he makes this new version of it. The new version is here. It's a little bit different, and, uh, but it's still the same idea. And again, if we blew it up, it'd be real fuzzy. This is the best we could do for it. But he's still knocking on the door. He's still king. Still has the lantern. Still has the weeds there. He looks a little different. And of course, it's in this ornate kind of frame. At the top of it, it says Lie of the World, which of course the title of the painting. In the bottom, you really can't see it, but in the bottom little section of it there is the passage, Behold, I Stand at the door and knock. And so he makes this and he gives it to St. Paul's Cathedral. And in 1908, it was, it was put up. Well, many years later, uh, because of the, the traffic around everything, they decide to clean the painting. And so uh, I don't know much about that, but apparently that's a pretty like, you know, you got to be very delicate in this process. So they, uh, they take the painting down and the restorer is removing the frame and the molding very carefully because they want to keep that and put that all back on. And they remove it and they find at the very bottom some words that you can't see when the frame is on. And it's frames that Holman Hunt wrote that he thought no one would see but him and Jesus. And the words say, forgive me, Lord Jesus, that I kept you waiting so long. Friends, Jesus is amazing and stunning I hope you caught a picture of him today. He's standing at the different doors, the closed off sections of our hearts and our church. And he's saying, let me in. Let's not keep him waiting. Open all the doors. 
of your mind, your heart, and your life and say, Lord Jesus, come in. I want you here. We want you here. And let's do it now. Will you pray with me? So if you've never opened the door of your life to Jesus before at all, there's going to be a prayer on the screen. We, we just call it the prayer of belief, and it's not magic words. It just gives language to you for the first time, not promising to be religious, not joining a church, not you're just opening your life to him. You're surrendering to him for the first time. You're saying that you believe he died to pay for your sins. You, die, you believe he rose from the dead. And you're saying, forgive me. Cleanse me. I surrender. If you've never done that before, why keep him waiting any longer? If you're a follower of Jesus, Is there some part of your life he's just at the door knocking on? See, what I want for you, Christian, what I want for you, Crossbridge, is to not have to write Holman Hunt's words. I don't want you to be like, forgive me, I kept you waiting so long. Don't wait any longer. Open the doors. Let him in. I surrender. Your will, not my will. Your kingdom, not my kingdom. Your strength, not my strength. Your ways, not my ways. I buy from you now, Jesus, by giving you my life. Freshly surrender, freshly yours. What door do you need to open and say, Jesus, I want you here? Jesus, come in. Where is he poking on your heart right now and saying, let me in? I'm knocking. If you, you hear me, let me in. I just want to be your friend. I want to bring you all that I am and all that I have. He's the true wealth. He's the true treasure. He stands and he knocks and he's calling you. Jesus, as best we know how today, wherever you're knocking, we open the door and we say, come in, we want you here, you're welcome here, make yourself at home, redecorate, reorganize, come be who you said you'd be. You said, Jesus, if we open the door, you'd come in. So we're taking you at your word right now that by your Holy Spirit, you are moving into areas of our life right now. And we will not push you out. We will not close the door. We will not grieve and quench your spirit. With your help, we will say, no, have your way. We want to be a people whose hearts are completely yours, a wholehearted people. We don't want to be double-minded about things. We don't want to think... Well, we could do it God's way or we could do it our ways. Oh, Lord, save us from that. Help us be a people that say, you, we want you here. We want your influence. We want your word. We, we surrender. We want that in our lives. 
We want that in our church. We want that in our families. We want you here. Don't delay, friends. It's right now. Open up your heart. You can even open up and say, Jesus, I, I want to open the door. I'm really scared. Overcome my unbelief. Help me. I open the door now, and I, with fear and trembling, say, come in. Come into my future, my future life planning. Come into my vocation. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Make us more aware of your presence now. Help us hear the voice of Jesus voice that he speaks through the spirit to us. We worship you now, we respond to you. Because of your grace and your kindness, Jesus. We don't want to be a lukewarm people. We don't want to be a lukewarm church. So we by faith now. We're just going to keep opening doors. Come, Lord. We want you here.